Just kidding. But anyway, I wasn't here last week, so I didn't get a pick on you. I, I always try to make you feel a little bit uncomfortable. That seems to be my goal, or at least what you tell me. So I'm going to start off right away this morning with seeing if I can convict a few of you. Uh, I have a question. I guess I, I would like you to raise your hands if you will. And the question is this. Since last Sunday, since you were in church last Sunday, how many people have picked up their Bible and whether you were at work or at home or maybe like me, you took a quick trip to Philadelphia and back in about six or seven hours or whatever it is that you were doing during the week, how many of you read something out of your Bible in the past week? Okay, good, good. Now, one step further. For those people that read out of your Bible, how many of you did any background research associated with it? I mean, you dug into it a little bit. Maybe there was a name or a place or, or maybe you read some commentaries on, on whatever it was that you were reading in your Bible. How many of you did a little background research? Excellent. Very good. Very good. Now, I, I tell you that because the longer I'm a pastor and the longer I read the Bible, I realize that so much more of the message is contained within verses, within stories, within Scripture than seems to be given to us superficially. If we just kind of read the Bible like it's, you know, a Dick and Jane book or something of that nature or, or whatever other novel we read for entertainment, we miss so absolutely much of the message that there's so much more to be learned from the people who are telling the stories, from the times they're telling the stories in, from the historical context, from the locations they're telling the stories from. There's absolutely so much more to be learned. That's why you would, not only should we read the Bible, but we should study the Bible as well. For instance, for instance, a very common, well-known story of King David and Bathsheba. We all have heard of King David and Bathsheba. King David is, is in his palace and he's uh, stayed behind. His men have gone off to fight war and King David has stayed behind and he's out wandering around on his veranda and he looks over at the neighbor and there's this beautiful Bathsheba bathing. He's, he's smitten with her. He, he has to have this woman and so that's just what he does. He connives and he cheats and he convinces her uh, until they create this liaison and she actually ends up getting pregnant which puts him in a bad situation. And he ends up having to kill her husband Uriah which is one of the commanders in his army. Now, superficially, we look at that story of King David and Bathsheba, and in King David, we see the cheating husband. The, he's a cheat, he's a liar, he's all those things. We can look at Bathsheba, and, and we can say, oh, you know, she's not a whole lot better, really, because she was part of the liaison as well. We can also say, we can also say that you can't get away with that stuff, because if you read the entirety of the story, the baby that was born out of that liaison is actually taken from them. Now, those are all superficial things that we learn from King David's story. But if we go further with that simple story that we're all familiar with, we learn even more about King David, and there's some more lessons to be learned. And so here are just a few of them. If we read, we find out that David was aging. And, and in so many ways, he was kind of going through a midlife crisis, and he needed something to spark life again. And we know that midlife crises are something that you go through. You'll get that later. <laughs> but we know that it's something we all go through. So we can, we can reach out and say, hey, even King David had a midlife crisis where he wanted something more. We see that David had everything, and he did. David was all powerful. He had all the women he could want. He, he didn't have to do this. He had all the money and food and property and land and cattle and so forth. But because he did, he was bored. It's not always good to get everything that you want because it creates boredom. And sometimes you make choices, bad choices, simply out of boredom. David shirked his duties and paid the price. This story is the first instance where David did not leave his, lead his men into battle. He decided to stay behind. He, he was always a warrior for God. From the very moment that God called him, David was a warrior. And here it is, the first instance where he says, you know what? I think I'll stay behind. And bad things happen. And finally, David wandered away from God. I mean, that's, that's pretty obvious. He wandered away from God in his ways, and he got complacent in his religion and his dedication to God. Now, in each of those four points, we see that the story is so much more about a cheating man. And I, and I bring you that point just so that you can see that the background knowledge, the historical knowledge, the contextual knowledge of the Bible tells us so much more. Now, 
Megan, sorry, Megan was supposed to read. Emily just read for us a few minutes ago. I think I called Megan Emily last week, or Emily, I don't know, I'm all confused. But anyway, the verses that she just read out of the book of Jeremiah come from Jeremiah the prophet, and they're really kind of those, those happy-go-lucky verses. They're the ones that we read, and we say that God says he'll strengthen you, and God says he'll make you a strong pillar, and like an ironclad, and, and you can't be defeated. Now, here's the trouble with those verses. The trouble with those verses is that if our life is good, I think we look at verses like that and say, yeah, I see just what you're talking about, God. I'm upright. Things are going well in my life. You're protecting me. You're leading my way. But what happens or has a tendency to happen when things go really, really bad? Sometimes we can get kind of an attitude towards God. Sometimes we can read verses like that and say, no, wait a minute. You're sitting here promising me that nothing will overcome me and nothing will beat me down and nothing will take away what I want or what I need or my comfort. And yet all of that's happening. And part of the reason is, is that we, we look at this from the prophet Jeremiah and we say, Jer what does Jeremiah know what's going on in my life anyway? Guy lived 2,500 years ago or so. He always, he was, he's just a mouthpiece of God. God just gave him these words and said, hey, go spew these words out. Tell people that they're strong and that everything will be okay. What does Jeremiah know about the fact that I can't pay my rent or that I'm sick or that I just lost a loved one or I lost my job or the roof is leaking or whatever it is that's going on in my life? And see, you miss that point if you don't understand a little bit of background knowledge on Jeremiah. And if you do a little research on Jeremiah, what you find out is that this isn't someone who's detached from trouble. This is someone who's mired right in the middle of it. This is someone who's lived stuff that you've lived and much, much worse. And yet he has this positive attitude that God will bring you through. Here's just, I don't want to bore you too much, I'll go through these quickly, but just some of the circumstances that Jeremiah faced as he preached these words. Almost the entirety of the book of Jeremiah is taken from conflicts that he himself endured. It's like a personal narrative rather than just something that God gave him to speak. He was threatened by his own people for pressing God's message upon them. He kept, he kept preaching God's message to his own people, and they said, hey, we don't want no part of that. He was tried for his life by priests and other prophets for preaching of the temple. He was put in the stocks for predicting the destruction of the temple, which, by the way, came to pass. He had to flee for his life when his prophecies were announced. He was constantly hounded by kings and princes for his message. And ultimately, as the story goes, he was stoned to death in Egypt for continuing to preach and prophesy God's word. So when Jeremiah tells you that you can stand up and be strong in the face of adversity, and Jeremiah says that God will give you the words and God will give you the way and God will make you a strong pillar against everything that's against you, Jeremiah knows what he's talking about because he's lived it. He's been there. He's not just some mouthpiece. He's a man who's been through what you're going through. So in telling you all of that, I want you to understand the message in this scripture is that is not only that when life is good and going your way should you appreciate God's strength, but also when life is bad. But there's more. We still have to go a little bit deeper. You see, even before that, even, be, even beyond that, is this. Life isn't always going to be good. Even though God loves you, and even though God will support you, and even though God will see you through, bad things are going to happen to each and every one of us. And ultimately, as much as we don't sometimes like to admit to it, this body is going to die. Well, that's a pretty cheery message, isn't it? But there's more. See, we have to go deeper yet. Although bad things are going to always happen to us and that we will all pass from this world, the real promise, the strength, what God is promising through Jeremiah the prophet is that we will live on eternally in spirit. And here is where we get confused in the Bible so many times. 
We think that when God talks about protecting us and making a strong pillar and all the other words in the Bible will never leave you and forsake you, we think that what he's promising is a physical well-being. But all that God has ever promised is your spiritual well-being. Now, you can go to some churches or turn on your TV and they'll tell you that if you're pious enough and if you pray enough, and of course if you give enough to the church and you read your Bible enough and you pray enough and you hang out with Christians enough, that your life will be a bed of roses. But it's just not true. But what God promises is that spiritually, if you allow those things to make you stronger, you will ultimately be a better person and be in a better place. You see, what God promises is that He cares less for our physical comfort than He does for our spiritual growth. Now think about that. That sounds callous, right? God cares less for our physical comfort than for our spiritual growth. So when I'm in the middle of something and, and I'm hurting, I believe that God looks down on us and says, I know you're hurting in your body, but allow it to make you stronger in your spirit. That's hard to swallow sometimes. And for some of you that, that, that are old or older than I am, you know what I'm talking about. I get up every morning and my hips hurt and if my stomach's not hurting, I've discovered that I've lost more hair or got more gray hair, more wrinkles a pain or a bump or a bruise that I didn't have yesterday, relationships that are gone bad, difficulties paying bills or whatever it is, and you look at and we pray to God, don't we? God, take all of this away, yeah? And yet we wake up tomorrow and it's still there. You see, we're confused. What God will do will take those difficult situations, those difficult physical considerations, and he'll build up the Christ in you if you let him. And he'll make you stronger spiritually day after day. That's God's promise. Now that causes us to, to kind of have a complete change in our priorities or at least in the way we look at life. So I came up with some scenarios here and I don't want you to raise your hands or, or, or anything. Just think about them. If we're, if we're going to consider our spiritual well-being over our physical well-being, then that means that we have to kind of reprioritize a lot of things that we might have out of place. So here's kind of a few scenarios. Would God want you to pay your bills and then tithe, or would God want you to tithe first and then pay your bills? Would he want you to maintain a comfortable style of living or would he want you to tithe first? Would God want you to sit in a nice, comfortable church and give less to the poor, or give more to the poor and sit in a, in a tent if necessary? If we're taking our physical consideration and weighing it against our spiritual growth, which of those would God want us to do? Number three, would God want you to stop evangelizing or preaching or talking about God, or if you're a younger person, maybe reading your Bible at your desk or whatever it is at work, if you were threatened with firing or expulsion or detention or whatever it is that you got, or would God, God want you to continue to evangelize right up until the point of whatever bad things happen to you happen? Would God want you to be a different person to keep friends? You know, well, I'm going to hang out with these guys, so maybe I'm going to drink a little, maybe I'm going to cuss a little, maybe I'm going to smoke a little, maybe I'm going to cheat a little over here, but if I don't, they're not going to be my friends. Would God want you to do that, or would he say, say sayonara and be a good Christian? Would God want you to cave into peer pressure? There's all kinds of peer pressure out there. All kinds of it. Well, everybody's doing it. Everybody's wearing it. Everybody's smoking it. It's okay with everybody else. Or would God, does God want you to do things His way? In each and every one of those scenarios, there's a consideration for our physical comfort versus our spiritual growth. And when we put our physical comfort first, we miss the power of God's Word. 
We confuse it. We, we say, but it hurts, God. And God said, yeah, I know it hurts, but you're getting stronger spiritually. My son and I have this saying that we took from a movie, and, and we kind of throw it back and forth all the time. And it, to us, it's become kind of this joke, but it really has a deeper meaning. We say, it, it is better to live for, no, I'm sorry, it is better to die for something than to live for nothing. Now, that sounds kind of macabre, I know. Better to die for something than live for nothing. But what we have equated that to is that we both realize, and I'm so proud of my son for realizing this at 16, that life's going to hurt. That you're not always going to get your way. That sometimes pain's involved. But in the end, if you're doing what's right because it's right, you're going to be stronger inside. And let's face it, if you're big and strong and buff and all those things, or if you're super beautiful, people aren't going to remember you for that 30 or 40 years from now. People are going to remember you for who you were inside. Just like Cheryl said with the cookies, although I hate Oreos. The good stuff's on the inside. We spend so much time tending to the comfort on the outside, the beauty on the outside, the specimen on the outside, that we forget to take care of what's inside. And just one more time, I want to tell you that what God promises you is that he will take care of the inside, not the outside. One day we'll all get those new magical bodies and it won't matter. I imagine, I, I sometimes wonder, are we all going to look the same? And then I say, poor you. God cares about what's going on in here, not what's going on out here. God doesn't want, God doesn't want physical specimens. He wants spiritual heroes. So Jeremiah comes to us and says, hey, if you know my background, you know everything I've gone through, everything I've struggled with, everything I will face in the future. And yet I want to be the person to tell you, the person who's walked in your shoes, I want to be the person to tell you, don't worry about what it's like on the outside. Just focus on growing strong spiritually on the inside. That is God's promise in the Bible that he will take care of your spirit and that if you love him and obey him and live for him, that you will have eternal life in heaven with him. That's my message for today. I pray that each and every one of you grow stronger on the inside. We've mentioned all those people who are hurting on the outside. Let's get together and help them grow strong on the inside too. Let's give them the true word of God that says it's about spiritual growth and not physical comfort. Let us pray. Father God in heaven, we thank you for your message. And more so, we thank you for the people that give it. Jeremiah had so much more going on in his life that helps us to understand that, that it's not all about physical comfort, but spiritual growth. It's about the Christ inside of us. We thank you for building us up on the inside, God. We thank you for leading the way. We thank you for taking all the bad stuff in our lives and turning it into good. We love you. We praise your holy name. And we pray these things in the name of Christ our Savior and all the Lord's people say, Amen. This final song is kind of along the same lines as that. You know, it says, how long must I wait? How long must I suffer? How long must I hurt? God's answer is, as long as you deny me. I ask you to stand and join us in singing, Hold My Heart. Begging.
making art One life, that's all I have Right now I can barely stand If you're everything you say you are Won't you come close and hold my Turn to me. I'm on my knees. Father, will you run to me? Yeah. One tear in the driving rain. One voice in a sea of pain. Could the maker of the stars hear the sound of my breaking? One life, that's all I am Right now I can barely stand If you're everything you say you are Won't you come close and hold my heart So many questions without answers Your promises remain I can't see but I'll take my chances to hear you call my name, to hear you call my name. One tear in the driving rain, one voice in a sea of pain, could the maker of the stars hear the sound of my breaking heart one life that's all I am right now I can barely stand if you're everything you say you are won't you come close and hold my heart hold my you hold my heart hold my heart well, thank you all for coming out again today I hope that you receive something today that you can take with you and uh, go Broncos Go forth into the world in peace and dedicated to your service, O Lord. Let us hold fast to that which is good. Render to no person evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the needy and the afflicted. And honor all people. Let us love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of his Spirit, and may the peace of the Lord be with you. God bless you all.